Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. I don't know if you guys have heard of it before, but in 1977, the guy who made American Graffiti wrote and directed an obscure science fiction movie called Star Wars. Star Wars was considered a big gamble at the time it was made, with plenty of behind-the-scenes tumult and production delays, and plenty of people not getting it until it was actually completed and it became so damn popular. But back during its struggling days, Lucasfilm was looking for anything reasonable to promote the film, and one of those ways was a comic adaptation. They approached Marvel in 1975 when Stan Lee was in charge of the company, who basically told them that he wouldn't do it until they had at least finished the dang movie. Which, of course, they wouldn't for another two years. Fortunately, though, it seemed it seems that George Lucas enjoyed writer Roy Thomas's work on Conan the Barbarian, and they convinced him to take up the job of writing the adaptation. Thomas arranged another meeting with Stan Lee in 1976, who was finally convinced to go ahead with the project, particularly after their initial agreement was that Lucasfilm would not receive royalties on the book, which is kind of baffling because Star Wars, in case you hadn't noticed, kind of liked to put out toys and merchandise even before the Disney purchase until it received 100,000 sales. And surprise, surprise, the adaptation of the most popular movie ever did really well, leading to an ongoing Star Wars series at Marvel that lasted until 1986. Although interestingly, the first issue of the adaptation was released a few weeks before the movie came out, so people had a preview of what was to come in the film. Which might actually be a better justification in my mind of doing comic adaptations of movies nowadays, if like, the first part of it comes out before the film itself. Kind of a teaser of what to expect and to hype up the movie. Star Wars would leave Marvel in 1986, since... Well, the movies were over, and I have to imagine that interest in the ongoing waned without any new big Star Wars projects out there. Blackthorn Publishing picked up the license for those 3D comics, of which I've reviewed two before, but in 1991, the Star Wars license was picked up by Dark Horse, who did a massive amount of Star Wars comics until 2014, when the license swung back around to Marvel, since Disney owned both anyway. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. But let's go back to Dark Horse for a second. Hey, you know how the original trilogy is getting its own special edition that adds a bunch of stuff that's not necessary, but might make the movie prettier and also spawn a million memes about the timing of Han Solo shooting someone? What if we did that with the comics? In 1997, Dark Horse released a remastered version of Star Wars A New Hope, but this one was indeed based on the special editions version, so yes, random CGI lizards, really depressing looking CGI Jabba the Hutt, and indeed, Greedo shooting before Han. Unlike the original Marvel adaptation, this one was only four issues. That is not the one we're looking at! Sure, it might be fun to do that down the road as another review, since it'll be very different from the Marvel one, but one of the reasons why I want to do the original adaptations of the movies, especially A New Hope, is that it's a lot... clunkier. It was the first time anything related to Star Wars was released to the public, with the exception of the novelization, and the creators were doing a lot of their work based off of a screening of an early edit of the film, and obviously a comic written and drawn in the 70s is going to have its own liberties and style of writing than something made 20 years after the original movie, with ready access to home media to base the shots off of. But also like the movie re-releases that keep updating CGI, there was another remaster of A New Hope's comics, this time taking the original Marvel Comics and keeping the pencils, but re-inking and recoloring them to match the film a lot better. In most places, it's fine. The shading and lighting do clash a bit with an art style that was not intended for it, but there are what I can probably call effects shots that are just way overdone in the redone coloring. Just this brighter lens flare sheen on everything that looks much more at odds with this book than it should. And as such, I think it'll be more interesting to talk about this adaptation with the original coloring. Or at least the coloring done for a high-quality reprint of the issues. So let's dig into Star Wars number 1 to 6, aka the comic adaptation of Star Wars A New Hope.
Because we're doing six issues, we have to mostly skip the covers, but I will touch on them briefly because they're so funny nowadays after 40 plus years of Star Wars. These scans come from a different re-release of the original run, with the colors restored. You can tell thanks to the big Legends logo along the bottom, which is basically Disney's way of saying this is now non-canon. Although that's hilarious that it's being applied to the adaptation of the first movie. To me, that means the McClunky cut is the official canon version and everything without it apocryphal. A prank that the stormtroopers like to pull sometimes whenever Vader's in his healing tank is to paint his helmet green. He's actually a pretty good sport about it, and says it's his way of supporting eco-friendly super weapons. Enter Luke Skywalker! Will he save the galaxy? Or destroy it? It could be either, depending on who you ask about The Last Jedi. We open not exactly with the iconic shot of the underbelly of the Star Destroyer chasing the Rebel ship, but rather a shot from above where a much more stout-looking Star Destroyer is blasting it. This also used an earlier version of the crawl, now in narration captions. It is a period of civil war in the galaxy. A brave alliance of underground freedom fighters has challenged the tyranny and oppression of the awesome Galactic Empire. Since they're operating underground though, they're finding it really hard to fight spaceships. To crush the rebellion once and for all, the Empire is constructing a sinister new battle station. Powerful enough to destroy an entire planet, its completion will spell certain doom for the champions of freedom, but also spells a lot of tax benefits for the contractors. Striking from a fortress hidden among the billion stars of the galaxy, rebel spaceships have won their first victory in a battle with the powerful Imperial Starfleet. Eh, don't be too impressed, it was just them deciding where to go to lunch afterwards. The Empire fears that another defeat could bring a thousand more solar systems into the Rebellion, and Imperial control over the galaxy would be lost forever. Okay, so here's the plan. All the main systems defect to the Rebels too, and then since we're all there anyway, we just become the new Empire! For some reason, the rest of the creative team are all up top on the page, but Marie Severin, the colorist, got shoved into a text box below. Weird. Anyway, on board the blockade runner, we're already in the middle of the firefight between the stormtroopers and rebels. No explosion in the cramped corridor or anything. R2 and 3PO are trying to avoid the chaos. This is all your fault! I should have known better than to trust the logic of a half-sized thermos capsulary de-housing assister! De-housing assister? R2-D2 helped take away people's homes? We cut over to a scene that was removed from the final film, where Luke is spotting the battle from the surface of Tatooine. Luke Skywalker lowers his macro binoculars, standing transfixed for a moment. Whoa, man. I think the blue milk's starting to kick in! While Luke heads off to the nearby town of Anchorhead, we cut back to the ship to see a very blue Darth Vader strangling a Christmas elf. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a rebel who apparently had his normal uniform painted red and green for some reason. The rebellion is very festive. Around this time, they say, may the claws be with you. Where is the data you intercepted? We're on a diplomatic mission! Liar! I was freaking there when I killed half you guys in a hallway as you passed it off. Hell, I don't even have to be holding you up by my arm if I wanted to. I have got space magic that would let me do it! Darth Vader, Dark Lord of the Sith, tightens his fingers on the rebel officer's throat. But he still receives no answer. Huh, I wonder why he'd be receiving no answer while choking the dude. Interesting to see the word Sith pop up here, but nowhere in the actual movie. Anyway, he kills the rebel. The fool is dead. Start tearing the ship apart piece by piece until you have those tapes. Vader will go to extreme lengths to recover his Duran Duran tapes. 3PO finds R2 getting the plans uploaded to him by Princess Leia. The unknown girl who kneels by the smaller robot is probably beautiful by human standards. You're a beautiful woman, probably. But 3PO, being a robot himself, takes scant notice of her. Even if 3PO did give a crap about beautiful women, why would he care about that when they just got boarded by the space Nazis? After Leia runs off, 3PO asks R2 what they're gonna do, and R2 starts loading them into an escape pod. Despite 3PO's whiny objections, the two quickly get launched out of the ship. Stormtroopers soon find Leia. There's one of them. Set weapons for stun. I've set mine to kill! Man, screw the Senate! Killing things is much cooler! 
Before she can flee, she's hit with the stun ray, which in this panel looks more like a I'm blowing a hole in your chest setting, but hey, that would stun someone, I guess. Back on Tatooine, more of the deleted stuff with Luke as he arrives in Anchorhead to meet with his friends about what he saw. However, instead of talking to them, Luke is surprised to see his friend Biggs has returned. Hey, what happened? Didn't you get your commission? Why, uh, of course I got it. Signed aboard the Rand Ecliptic last week. First mate Biggs Darklighter at your service. Okay, what actually tells me that you're lying is that you said your name was Biggs at Darklighter. Luke tells them about the battle, but by now it's over and they can't spot anything, so they think Luke was just exaggerating. I keep telling you, Wormy, the Rebellion's a long way from here. I doubt if the Empire would even fight to keep this system. Yeah, I don't see this franchise ever coming back to this dump of a planet. Leia is dragged over to Vader. Lord Vader. I should have known. Only you could be so bold. Well, the Imperial Senate will not sit still for this. When they hear you've attacked a diplomatic- Don't play games with me, your highness. I literally saw this ship ten minutes ago over Scarif. Geez, you'd think I'd forget that? Well, in the interest of fairness, Vader does say that this ship passed through a restricted system. Several transmissions were beamed to the ship by spies, who are now unfortunately dead. But we'll still milk a Disney Plus series or two out of them. He orders Leia away, and one of the Imperial officers says that she should be killed. Vader rejects this because they still need to find the rebel base and she's their only link. Still, there could be political fallout from this, so he orders a fake distress signal sent talking about a meteorite storm and that the ship will then be vaporized. I've been informed that a repair pod was somehow jettisoned during the fighting. I think the officers need to get their eyes checked because there's a difference between an escape pod and a repair pod. He figures the data is on board and they need to go down and retrieve it. Send a detachment down to retrieve them without attracting attention. I'd go down myself, but, you know, sad. Plus, I don't want to run into my relatives. They get on my back for not calling them enough. Back on Tatooine, below, in the place called Junland, or No Man's Land. We could just call it that, but some cartographers were feeling extra that day. R2 and 3PO have survived, and our golden friend is doing what he's best at. Complaining. What a forsaken place this is. We seem to be made to suffer. Man, how bad have the last 20 years been for him, considering he doesn't even remember all the crap he went through in the prequels? As in the film, the two separate as 3PO doesn't want to go the same way, but in a bit of efficiency, probably for the sake of the adaptation, R2 is captured by the Jawas while 3PO is ranting. Back over to Luke and Biggs Light Darker. Biggs admits that he's planning on jumping ship once the frigate he's on goes to the central systems and try to join the rebels. Luke bemoans that he wants to join too, but he's stuck on Tatooine for another season. What good is all your uncle's work if he ends up merely a tenant soon, slaving away for the greater glory of the Empire? Yeah, I mean, the Empire is really taking advantage of all that... moisture he farms. Biggs leaves and Luke says he'll always be the best friend he has. Cutting the scenes with Biggs definitely makes sense for the breakneck pacing they wanted to have for the original Star Wars. Constant motion, next plot point, action and adventure. But it feels like we missed out a bit by cutting this. Not just because Biggs shows up for the final battle and we've otherwise never seen him before in the film, thus the emotional impact of his death is lost, but because it gives us a better idea of how boring life on Tatooine really is and why Luke would want to get away from it. It helps build his character and the audience's relationship with him when we see more of him early on like this. Otherwise, we get the impression that our main characters are the trash can we can't understand, and the annoying gold robot with bad articulation. Anyway, we cut over to a soulless Imperial conference room somewhere in the galaxy. Well, if they had just put in the decorative fern like I recommended, it wouldn't be quite as soulless now, would it? This is the scene with the Imperial commanders discussing the risk of the Death Star plans and concern over the Senate catching word of its existence, shown much earlier than it was in the film. Admiral Mahdi is convinced the Death Star is invulnerable, while Commander Tag, who, by the way, I just assumed for like years was a very young calm meanie of Star Trek fame, sounds just like him. But no, different actor altogether. Man, Star Trek is always on my brain even when watching other franchises. Is worried that this attack on Leia and her ship will just build up support for the Rebellion in the Senate. Grand Moff Tarkin enters with a very stout-headed Vader in tow. The Imperial Senate is no longer of any concern to us, gentlemen. The filibuster rules are intact. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council. 
permanently. The last remnants of the old republic have been swept away. The regional governors now have direct control over their territories. Impossible! How will the emperor maintain control without the bureaucracy? And what are we gonna do with the big room with all the floating spinning disk platforms? Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station which nears completion. We're going to make a big TV special touring it with celebrity guest stars and encouraging tourism via the recreation deck. How does everyone feel about little Death Star-shaped malted milk balls as a signature snack? If the Rebels have obtained a complete technical readout of this battle station, it is possible, however unlikely, that they might find a weakness and exploit it. Or worse, they'll start selling bootleg versions of it for suckers to buy, thinking they're the real thing! Admiral Mati thinks there's no chance regardless of whatever plans they found. This battle station is now the ultimate power in the universe. Don't become too proud of this technological terror you've created, Admiral Mati. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the cosmic force. Eee, is it though? Just saying, I'm not seeing you guys building any planet-destroying super weapons by plugging a Jedi in as its battery. Don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways, Lord Vader. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion hasn't helped you conjure up those stolen data tapes. Ancient? It was like 20 years ago. Hell, we were still hunting rogue Jedi like 10 years ago. The nostalgia cycle has left you behind, Lord Vader. Just accept that you're not cool anymore. Vader does the force choke on him. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I find it more disturbing than in these panels we see him levitate a coffee cup over to himself and still be holding it. Can he seriously drink through that thing? I'm just saying, that was a parody thing done in Spaceballs. Also, points for the comic version actually showing the Force being used for telekinesis long before it actually happened in Empire Strikes Back. Guess that was always a thing. Tarkin orders him to knock it off and reassures the commanders that Vader will find the plans by the time the station is fully operational. Back on Tatooine, 3PO got picked up by the Jawas and is reunited with R2. They're led outside to the Skywalker farm along with other droids. Luke, tell your Uncle Owen that if he gets a translator to be sure it speaks Bocce. Luke screws up and gets a droid that speaks Lacrosse instead. Owen thinks that R2 looks like crap but picks up 3PO because he speaks Rugby and R5-D4. Luke, take them to the garage and clean them up. But I was going into Tashi Station to- After you finished your chores. Aw, he didn't let him finish the sentence about picking up power converters. Which was code for buy space drugs. However, R5-D4, not named in this, but I actually had a toy of him as a kid, blows its top. Uncle Owen, this R2 unit has a bad motivator! Well, when the director's instructions are just walk five feet and explode, would you have good motivation for the scene? By the way, this is also an example of Star Wars refusing to just let mistakes be mistakes. Either Luke said something wrong, or admit, hey, the toys made up the name for this thing later, but don't worry about it. Like I said, he's an R5 unit, not R2, but expanded media had to explain, oh, there's a line of R2 units that are housed in R5 K. Like, I'm a pedantic nitpicker, it's my entire shtick, but even I would not give a crap about this. Why was it necessary to explain stuff like that away? 3PO recommends R2 instead, and the Jawas give them the blue guy as compensation. Don't you forget this, R2. Why I stick my neck out for you is beyond my capacity to- Asshole! I got rocket jets in my legs! I was planning on leaving your golden ass behind, regardless of where we ended up! Luke whines to the droids as he repairs them that he's never gonna get off this planet, but then notices something jammed into R2. He accidentally activates it, a hologram of Leia. In this version, the holograms are actually better quality than in the movies, with full color instead of being flickering blue ones. Seriously, if we ever do get a Star Wars and Star Trek crossover, someone's gonna show the Star Wars people a holodeck, and they're gonna freak the hell out about that tech. What's this? A three-dimensional hologram, and she's beautiful. Wow, I sure hope I don't regret this boner later. But who is this girl? I think she was a passenger on our last voyage, sir, but I don't... Okay, even putting aside retcons involving Rogue One, 3PO is a protocol droid. Would he not know who was a sitting senator or who was on board their ship in order to, you know, follow protocol? The message is repeating, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and R2 is claiming that he's the property of Obi-Wan. 3PO has no idea what he's talking about, since his memory got wiped and all at the end of Revenge of the Sith. I don't know any Obi-Wan, but there's an old Ben Kenobi who lives out beyond the Dune Sea. Sort of a hermit. And his last name isn't something ridiculous like Sunshaker or whatever, so it must be him! 
He removes the restraining bolt that allows them to control R2 and keep him from leaving on his own, hoping to get more of the message, but R2 claims to have picked up a bug. Now the holograms disappeared, girl and all! The hologram was only of the girl. What's the and all part that vanished? Later at dinner, Luke mentions the recording and Obi-Wan, and in the comic, Owen is much more pissed about bringing up Obi-Wan, even though the dialogue is the same as the movie. It's a name for another time. That can only mean trouble. Things from the past are evil and trouble. Troublesome. Strike them down, Luke! You stay away from that old wizard, do you hear me? He's dangerous! Jeez, what the hell happened in Obi-Wan Season 2 that got this reaction? He orders Luke to wipe their memories tomorrow and continues his streak of parenting by saying that Luke can't apply to the Academy, or Academy as it's misspelled, unless that's just how Star Wars spells it because how dare we have a typo, since they need his help. Owen says that he can do so in another year, but apparently he's made that promise before. Luke walks off. Owen, we can't keep him here forever. Most of his friends are gone. I'll make it up to him next year, I promise. May I become a charred skeleton if I don't. Luke's just not a farmer, Owen. He's got too much of his father in him. That's what I'm afraid of. It really is shocking how the Vader and Anakin connection wasn't planned from the start, because it fits so well with all the dialogue in this movie. We don't get Luke watching the sunset, understandable cut, but sucks to lose it, as Luke discovers that R2 is taken off on his own to find Obi-Wan since his restraining bolt was removed. No sign of him, even with these electro binoculars. Because, you know, we're in space. Man, Luke, you really should trade in those electro binoculars for a bus ticket on Coruscant. Anyway, 3PO asks why they can't go after him. Not at night, it's too dangerous with all the sand people around. Damn Fremen! In the morning, the two head out while stormtroopers find the abandoned escape pod. The small piece of metal I found in the sand. Droids. Little known fact, droids poop metal. Luke and 3PO soon find R2, but he detects creatures approaching. Sand people, or worse, insurance salesmen. They're quickly attacked, with a lot of narration giving names to things like the Tusken Raiders' Gaddafi staff, ending issue one. Which interestingly is only 17 pages long, not counting advertisements. It's just weird how content changes over time since, yeah, comics being that short now that I think about it, was pretty common back then, though frequently they'd have backup stories to fill in the rest. The cover for issue two is a pretty normal type of cover for this era, exaggerating an event in the issue a bit more. In this case, the Cantina fight now has like everyone trying to pile on Obi-Wan and Luke. More interestingly is this tagline, Luke Skywalker strikes back. Sure, it's not like Star Wars invented the phrase strikes back, but it is a weird coincidence to have an early Star Wars thing use that phrasing, isn't it? Also, check out this early Star Wars logo on the first page. We were robbed of a logo that had actual stars in it. Anyway, the Tusken Raiders are chased off by Obi-Wan making some echoing moaning noise. I'd rather not know what that means. But the point is, he's rescued Luke and, wow, Howard Chaykin must have been a fan of Alec Guinness because he's the only one so far who actually properly looks like his actor. You see it even more in the remastered coloring. Claims to be the property of someone called Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan. Now that's a name I haven't heard in a long while. That asshole owes me money. Much as I like the Obi-Wan series, it is kind of weird that he says he hasn't heard the name in a while when it really wasn't that long ago. I think my uncle knew him. He says he's dead. Oh, he's not dead. Not yet. Not yet. He's me. I haven't gone by the name Obi-Wan since before you were born. Insurance fraud's a hell of a thing, Luke. They find 3PO who fell over during the scuffle and his arm came off. Where am I? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I must have taken a bad step. Quickly, replace my arm with a red one! Back at Obi-Wan's place, the order of events is different from the final movie. They activate Leia's hologram immediately before the other conversations. And yeah, that was a good change in the movie. Leia's message is the call to action that requires immediately saying yes or no, not screwing around talking about Luke's dad and the Force right afterwards. General Obi-Wan Kenobi, I present myself in the name of my father, Bail Antilles, Viceroy of Alderaan. Years ago, Commander, you served the Old Republic in the Clone Wars. And since everyone seems to like that show, we need you to come back and save us all again. Information vital to the survival of the Rebel Alliance has been placed in this droid. Please see this R2 unit delivered safely to Alderaan. You are our last hope. When you get right down to it, Obi-Wan basically retired to become a delivery boy. Whoever she is, she's terrific. She did a phenomenal job of standing there begging for help. You fought in the Clone Wars? Oh yes, I was once a Jedi Knight, just like your father. But way cooler. For instance, I actually could grow a beard. 
I do love the shot of Obi-Wan in shadows. Would've worked better when describing how Anakin died, but still nicely moody. Your Uncle Owen didn't agree with your father's ideals. Was really against child murder for some reason. Thought he should have stayed here on Tatooine and not gotten involved. In the ten minutes that he met him, he really sussed out your father. Obi-Wan gives Luke his father's lightsaber. Your father wanted you to have this when you were old enough. Okay, one, old enough from what we saw in the prequels was like four years old. Two, how does he know that? Anakin kept the pregnancy secret until the end. Three, why would he want to give him his lightsaber? If he was going to be a Jedi, wouldn't he want to have Luke make his own? Not unexpectedly, the lightsaber is not blue, but pink. Too much pink energy is dangerous. Your father's lightsaber. The formal weapon of a Jedi Knight. The Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. Just don't ask us to free any slaves. How did my father die, Ben? Uh. You thunder against me! I What you made me. He tripped and fell on his lightsaber. The important safety tip, Luke. They should put a warning label on these things. He was betrayed and murdered by a young Jedi named Darth Vader. A boy I was training. One of my brightest disciples. My greatest failure. Somewhere, Vader is looking up and grumbling, I am not your failure, Obi-Wan. Darth Vader used the power of the Force for evil to help the Empire hunt down and destroy the last of the Jedi Knights. Vader was seduced by the dark side of the Force, and it consumed him. The Force? Why do you keep saying it with quotation marks, Ben? It makes it sound like you're being sarcastic. The Force is an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds, binds the galaxy together. Knowledge of the Force is what gives a Jedi Knight his power. There's also the midi-chlorians and the whills, but we'll get into all that when you're ready for the advanced Jedi classes. Obi-Wan says Luke needs to come with him to Alderaan and learn the ways of the Force, but Luke refuses, saying he can't get involved with something so far away. That's your uncle talking. Remember, the Force is with all men, binding them together. The suffering of one is the suffering of all. That's a good line and life philosophy, but probably best that it got cut given everything that happens in the franchise. While Leia is interrogated not by a ball droid, but whatever the hell this thing is, our heroes spot a Jawa transport that's been recently destroyed. Luke thinks it was the Tusken Raiders. We never heard of them hitting something this big. They didn't, Luke. But we were meant to think so. Yeah, I mean, imagine someone thinking that the Empire was doing something evil otherwise. Look at those blast points. Only Imperial Stormtroopers are this precise. Oh man, I can't believe I actually said that with a straight face. Luke realizes that these are the same Jawas who sold them R2 and 3PO. Thus, if they were able to track the two to the transport, they'd be able to track them to his farm. And indeed, he quickly rushes back to discover the farm in flames. Then he suddenly sees two smoldering piles which had once been human beings. Oh good! Owen and Beru were able to kill two stormtroopers! Back in the Death Star, the station is now fully operational, though Leia was able to resist their interrogation. As such, Tarkin has a new plan to get her to talk, having them set course for Alderaan. Luke reunites with the others. Ben, I want to go with you to Alderaan. There's nothing here for me now. That's not true! You still got Tashi Station and power converters! They head to Mos Eisley's spaceport. You won't find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. I can name like five places in Star Wars off the top of my head filled with worse people than in Mos Eisley. Get out of the house sometimes, old man. He uses the Jedi mind trick on the stormtroopers who want to see some identification, explaining to Luke how the Force can be used to influence the mind. A powerful ally, though you will discover it can also be a danger. The Force hits you with microtransactions faster than you would expect. They head into the cantina to start looking for a pilot to bring them to Alderaan, though of course that just leads to the confrontation at the bar with the aliens who have the death sentence in 12 systems! And of course, Obi-Wan pulls his lightsaber to deal with them. Ben's own lightsaber comes suddenly to life, and a wide-eyed Luke Skywalker is abruptly reminded that old Ben Kenobi was once Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Jedi Knight. He's been killing people in bars long before Luke was born. Only when the two aggressors lie in sections on the floor does the old man's body appear to relax, or the suggestion of a sigh escape him. Oh god, I need a death stick and to rethink my life. Ben has already met Chewbacca and introduces him to Luke. The art is 
interesting on him. Kind of makes it look like he has a mustache, even though he's 98% fur. While R2 and 3PO hide from stormtroopers outside, our heroes meet Han Solo. I'm Han Solo, captain of the Millennium Falcon. Chewie tells me you're looking for passage to the Alderaan system. If it's a fast ship. Fast ship? You mean you never heard of the Millennium Falcon? What the hell is an aluminum falcon? This panel right here is another good recreation of the shot in the movie, which is interesting because a lot of the comic hasn't really followed the cinematography or individual scene composition of the movie so far. Anyway, when they say they want to avoid the Empire, he asks for 10,000 credits in advance. Obi-Wan says they don't have it on them, but if they'll take a 2,000 deposit, they can get him 15,000 at Alderaan. Let's just say their leader owes me a big one for rescuing their daughter, who is also currently captured. Come to think of it, bet I can get another 20,000 if I rescue her again. He agrees, Luke and Ben hurrying off when some stormtroopers enter the bar. I'm afraid you'll have to sell your speeder, Luke. It's all right, I don't think I'll ever come back to this planet anyway. Yeah, just imagine if somebody symbolically buried you here on this dung heap of a planet that you hated and never wanted to come back to. It would be pretty disrespectful and missing the point entirely, wouldn't it? In the bar, Greedo shows up to get the money Han owes Jabba. As for the age-old meme about Han shooting first, we've got this new contender for the fight. Han shoots early, as in this comic, he shoots Greedo before the I've been looking forward to this bit. Han tosses a coin to the bartender. Sorry for the mess. Why do people keep coming to this bar when the murder rate is like 500% higher than everywhere else? Luke sells his speeder to pay for the down payment, but a figure in black follows them. At the docking bay, we have a scene that was restored in the special edition but also something different for the comic, since apparently the creators didn't have access to the production material. Jabba the Hutt himself showing up at the hangar to talk to Han, and look, it's totally Jabba! Yellow skin, weird white sideburns beard, beady eyes, orange tunic, two legs. The scene was pointless and a good cut because it just repeated information we already had in the Greedo scene. For the special edition, it was more just to have a bigger incentive to see the special edition by including deleted scenes, plus George Lucas getting to play with effects technology. Still, I enjoyed Han's last line in it, especially since it wasn't intended for slug Jabba, calling him a wonderful human being. It's... Different in the comic. I'll pay you, Jabba, but not because you threaten me. I'll pay you because it's my pleasure. Ugh, does Han want to get into the gold bikini in this version? So what's the expanded universe explanation for this Jabba? A robot he's speaking through? Jabba was on some weird drugs at the time? Hallucination on Han's part? After an unnecessary detour to the Death Star to, again, remind us of information we already know, Luke and Obi-Wan arrive at the hangar. Unfortunately, the cloaked figure ratted them out, so stormtroopers start firing on them. Our heroes make a quick escape into orbit, but are attacked by three Star Destroyers that all apparently are putting out pink exhaust fumes. Pink smoke is when you know the situation is serious. Can't you outrun them? I thought you said this thing was fast. Luke Skywiner. Just then, the entire spacecraft shudders as a blinding explosion flashes just outside the viewports. And even a near miss almost overcomes the phototrophic shielding. And if this ship was a plant, those words would mean something. Han says it'll take them a few minutes to calculate the coordinates for jumping to light speed. Without the proper calculations, we could pass through a star, or bounce too near a supernova, or slam right into one of the Star Destroyers, which would be cool and all, but probably an impractical strategy given the cost of a ship, the size of a projectile necessary to actually do damage to it, the risk of being blown out of the sky before you can do it, and also because apparently we haven't invented autopilot in this universe. Issue 2 ends with our heroes jumping to light speed, which is a very neat effect for the comic, since obviously they had no idea how this would look in the movie, creating this rainbow of star patterns behind them. Third issue's cover, nothing to say here. We catch up right in the middle of Tarkin threatening to destroy Alderaan to Leia. She gives the name Dantooine as the location of the rebel base, and then destroys Alderaan anyway because he's a dick. You know, aren't the regional governors supposed to be in charge of their own systems now? Seems like they'd be pretty pissed about one of their planets blowing up. Unless they were already on Alderaan, I suppose. On board the Falcon, Obi-Wan feels something and lets out a groan. I felt... A sudden great ebbing in the Force, Luke. Wait, no, it's just that salad I got at the cantina. What was in that dressing? The Force? You mean that thing you talked about? The energy that's given out by all living things? No, the T-Force, Luke. What do you think? Yes, it was like the cry of a billion beings stopping all at once. Well, hey, a billion people stopped crying. That's good, right? 
Nearby, R2 and Chewbacca are playing space chess, with the former winning and the latter being mad about that. Han recommends that it's not wise to piss off a Wookiee, implying that Chewie could rip his arms off if he loses. I suggest a new strategy, R2. Let the Wookiee win. Maybe his nickname should be Cheater, then. Obi-Wan trains Luke in the use of his lightsaber with a floating purple ball. When he can't evade its shots, Obi-Wan puts a helmet on him so he can't see. Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. Remember, a true Jedi Knight such as your father and I can feel the Force flowing from him. You mean that it controls your actions? Yes, but it also obeys your commands. The Force is a switch. Thanks to Obi-Wan's advice, Luke is able to deflect the giant coronavirus, saying he could definitely feel the Force. Hocus Pocus religions and ancient weapons are no substitute for a good blaster at your side, kid. Ignore him, Luke. He doesn't believe in the Force. Blasters will do you no good against the powers of darkness. Here, let me tell you about the time I defeated General Grievous. I... wait. They arrive in the Alderaan system, but immediately upon re-entering normal space, they're caught in the debris field of the planet. In this version, Han actually recognizes that Alderaan's been destroyed instead of denying the possibility. They spot a TIE fighter and want to destroy it before it can identify them, with some wonky word balloon placement in this panel, but see it heading for a small moon. That's no moon, Mr. Solo. It's a space station. It's only a model. It's actually 3PO who delivers the classic, I've got a bad feeling about this, which is soon justified as they're caught in the Death Star's tractor beam and dragged in. On the Death Star, Tarkin learns that the rebel base at Dantooine is long since abandoned, so Leia indeed lied to them. Tarkin orders her execution, but Vader says that she can still be useful, especially now that they've captured the Falcon. On the hangar deck, a search of the ship found nothing, and the log has been altered to say that the crew abandoned ship after takeoff. And it does make me wonder if anyone actually believed that, because that implies that the Star Destroyers over Tatooine are so bad at their jobs that they let a ship get away and go into hyperspace without a crew. Keep checking. I sense something. A presence such as I haven't felt since... Hanging in mid-sentence, Darth Vader turns quickly and exits. Now again, I like the Obi-Wan series, but it feels like that line would have had more power if it had been 20 years since their last encounter instead of just 10. Inside the ship, our heroes stowed away in some smuggling compartments, though it looks much more obviously to be a hatch instead of some loose floor panels like in the movie. While they could fly out, the Death Star's tractor beam will just get them pulled right back in, so it needs to be disabled. Obi-Wan sent off to go deal with that. To help, our heroes lure some stormtroopers inside and steal their uniforms. So I decided to see if there was an expanded universe story about what happened to the stormtroopers' bodies, or if they, you know, woke up and wandered out later or something. And instead, I discovered that one of said stormtroopers was having a secret love affair with Tarkin. The expanded universe is wild, people! Our heroes kill the personnel in a security office, and R2 accesses the Death Star computers. They find the location of the tractor beam power reactor, and maps to get there for Obi-Wan, who wants the rest to stay there. After Obi-Wan heads out, R2 discovers that Leia is there. Luke wants to rescue her, but Han isn't so sure. But I've seen her, Solo! She's beautiful! So's life! She's rich! So's... huh? Rich? Yes, and if we rescue her, the reward will be more wealth than you can imagine! I don't know, I can imagine quite a bit. Even out here, I know about swimming in money Scrooge McDuck style. Han agrees, and wow, I finally noticed that he has black hair in a lot of this comic. They put Chewie in some loose handcuffs and act as prisoner and escorts, bringing him to the detention area where they're holding Leia. Chewie then breaks loose, and our heroes shoot down the cameras and the security guards. While Luke goes to get Leia out, Han hears someone calling. I'm in security center. Uh, everything under control, slight weapon malfunction. What happened? We're all fine, thank you. How about you? We're sending a squad up. Uh, negative. Reactor leak. Uh, give us a few minutes to- Who is this? What's operating? And he shoots the console. It's a boring conversation anyway. For you, maybe, but for the guy on the other side of the line, this was the most action he's had in months! Luke finds Leia's cell. You're even more beautiful than I- OH MY GOD COMIC! I GET IT! YOU WERE WRITTEN BEFORE LUCAS DECIDED THE TWO WERE SIBLINGS! PLEASE STOP! Aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? Aren't you a little judgmental on people's physical appearances for a member of a resistance movement fighting fascism? Informing her that they're with Obi-Wan, the group are soon pinned down in the corridor by stormtroopers, ending Issue 3. Issue 4's cover is a very cool visual of a looming giant Darth Vader about to play with our tiny heroes. I didn't see you playing with your dolls again! Good! As well as Leia in little red slippers, but goofier than that, 
Obi-Wan in a green cloak. I'm in exile from the Empire. I'd better wear something inconspicuous. We continue where we left off, though our heroes are taking considerably less cover than in the movie. Luke tries to call 3PO for an exit route for them, but the two droids hear knocking at the security office's door. This is some rescue. When you came in, didn't you have a plan for getting back out? Well, you know, what's really helping is whining about it. Is this just a Skywalker thing? Leia shoots a hole into a garbage chute, the four tumbling down into it. The walls are made of a metal that ricochets blaster fire, but what's worse is that someone must have bought a baby tentacle monster and then flushed it when it got too big for its tank, since there's a creature here that tries to eat Luke. It eventually lets him go, but only because somebody turned on the trash compactor. They try to brace the walls with some rather sizable piping or support beams that are in there. Who threw those away? But the compactors are strong enough to crush those. 3PO and R2 are able to bluff their way past the stormtroopers that come in and finally get in touch with Luke. They shut down the compactor, allowing our heroes to escape. Nearby, Obi-Wan reaches the equipment for the tractor beam and begins shutting it down. Now he, like the others, is a fugitive on board this sprawling battle station. And he even as he makes certain adjustments in a computer terminal, and several lights change from red to blue, Obi-Wan's brilliant plan? Mess with colorblind people. Once our heroes are free from the trash compactor, Leia clashes with Han over who should be in charge. They reach an observation deck over the hangar and try to figure out a safe way to return to the ship. You know, kid, getting back to the Falcon's gonna be like flying through the five fire rings of Fornax. Huh. Guess they were saving the explanation for that one for Solo 2. Stormtroopers soon find them and Han chases them back, reasoning that they're not used to people who actually fight back against them. In the movie, he yells like a madman until they reach the Stormtroopers' reinforcements, but here he just corners them so they're forced to turn around and fight. Luke and Leia, equally chased, come across a door to a bottomless pit because, as I think we're pretty clear about across this entire franchise, safety railings are for suckers. I mean, why bother anyway? Every person we see fall into a bottomless pit in this franchise franchise inexplicably survives even if they're blown up or cut in half first. Luke swings across it with a grappling hook that of course he has, what with being a farmer on a desert planet. Oh wait, my mistake. He got it from the stormtrooper belt he still had on. Why does a stormtrooper who works on a space station need a grappling hook as part of their everyday equipment? Oh my god, is the grappling hook the actual legit way to get around the station with all the bottomless pits? In the movie, Leia gives Luke a peck on the cheek for good luck. In the comic, it's full on the mouth because this comic really, really did not want these two to end up being related. They get across and shoot back at the stormtroopers following, continuing their escape. Obi-Wan starts returning to the Falcon, but finds Darth Vader waiting for him just outside of the hangar. I have been waiting, Obi-Wan Kenobi. The circle is now complete. When I left you, I was but a learner. Now I am the master. Are you seriously still angry about not getting that promotion to master? That job doesn't even exist anymore, man. You still have much to learn. Oh, I don't know. I mean, you don't have the high ground now, do you? Both activate their pink or sometimes purple lightsabers. Your power's a weak, old man. You should never have come back. No cheating with a bunch of rocks this time, asshole. You only know half the Force, Vader. You perceive its full power as little as a spoon perceives the taste of food. Well, thanks to you, I can't use spoons or food, so go to hell, Obi-Wan. The rest of our heroes regroup and move for the Falcon, but the fight between Vader and Obi-Wan starts moving towards it as well, getting the attention of both the good and bad guys. This is a fight you cannot win, Darth for I have grown much since our parting. For instance, I've come to realize how stupid a statement only a Sith deals in absolutes really is. If my blade finds its mark, you will cease to exist. But if you cut me down, I will only become more powerful. I'll grow back like a worm, and then there'll be two of me. It's an old Jedi technique. Heed my words. Not this time. I am the master now. I, Darth Vader. And yeah, unlike the movie, Vader actually does properly hit him and he like zaps. Uh, yeah, check out that expression. I think there might be a bit of pain before the whole more powerful than you can imagine bit. There is no death, there is only the force. No, this, this is, looks like death. Still, he does just disappear, much to Vader's puzzlement. Of course, Luke seeing this makes him start shooting at Vader, the stormtroopers firing back at him, and they make their escape to end the issue. Cover for issue 5 is fine, another exaggeration of events, this time of the Death Star attacking Yavin, but with normal lasers instead of the planet-destroying one. Also, 
Luke Skywalker strikes again! Wait, does the cover think that Luke Skywalker is in charge of the Death Star? Han and Luke head into the Falcon's laser turret stations to fight off the pursuing TIE fighters. The addition here is a bunch of thought clouds showing Luke's, Han's, and Leia's reactions both to Obi-Wan's death and the situation they're in. It's not necessary, of course, as we saw in the final film, but it allows for some character expansion over the events that just transpired. Hell, we even get Luke saying that he needs to get the hang of using the Force to help him in this fight. Narration boxes add to some of the drama of the fight. Normally I'm against this, since I prefer the artwork to speak for itself, but hey, you've got limited time to show off the events of the film, and it adds a bit of flavor to this. Especially, as I said, Luke actually letting the Force guide him to destroy a fighter. Though one could argue that the inclusion of that diminishes the climax of the film, since we already know Luke can use the Force like that in space combat. After the celebrations of their victory over the fighters, we learn both from Leia's speculation and a cutaway to Tarkin and Vader that they let the Falcon escape, equipped with a homing beacon to track them to the Rebel base. This will be a day long remembered. It has seen the end of the last of the Jedi Knights, and soon, very soon, it will see the end of the Rebellion itself. I've got a good feeling about today, Tarkin. Drinks on me when this is all over. Oh, well, here's how you know this is a bad adaptation. We see Tarkin wearing boots instead of slippers like Peter Cushing had on. Back on the Falcon... What do you mean our escape was too easy? They let us escape, don't you see? They know we will take R2-D2 straight to the Rebel base, and they undoubtedly mean to trail us there. Okay, one, dick move from the Empire then for letting so many of their troops and then the fighters die to let you guys escape. Two, shouldn't you not go to the base then and start searching the ship for a homing beacon? Maybe arrive at a big open port supposedly to refuel, drop off the Princess and R2, and then jump away again to try to get them off the trail? Han makes it clear he doesn't care about the Rebellion, he just wants the cash reward for all this. Leia accepts that, though she's clearly pissed at his attitude. Luke goes to talk with Han. I don't know, Luke. Do you think it's possible for a princess and a guy like me? No. And geez, just look at how pissed Luke is in this version. It's Leia and I that are clearly getting together, Han. There is nothing that could possibly prevent that from happening. The Falcon arrives at Yavin 4 and joins up with the Rebellion, who quickly analyze the data from R2 and come up with a plan. The Death Star is designed to fight off a large-scale assault, big guns for capital ships kind of things, so smaller vessels like fighters are able to get in closer to it, though normally fighters can't do any damage. An analysis of the plans provided by Princess Leia... Wait, do you mean Leia? She's like a bigwig in the Rebellion and was a senator. How could you get her name wrong, dude? There is a small, unshielded thermal exhaust port that runs directly into the reactor system. A direct hit on it should set up a chain reaction that will destroy the station. Let us bow our heads in remembrance of Galen Erso and the Rogue One team for making all this possible. What about Kyle Katarn? Who? However, the exhaust port is only two meters across, and they're approaching it from a weird angle at top speed, so actually shooting it to go in and all the way down into the reactor is kind of hard. And remember, only a direct hit is a hope of destroying the Death Star, before it destroys this moon and the hope of the Rebellion. Now you all go on the dangerous mission while the rest of us all sit around not evacuating everything in case things go wrong. Now man your ships, and may the Force be with you. Um, excuse me, it's the Force in quotation marks? As Luke prepares to join the other fighter pilots, he spots Han and Chewie loading up their reward money. Han invites Luke to come with them, and Luke likewise to them, but Han thinks the plan is insane and won't work. Well, take care of yourself, Han, but I guess that's what you're best at, isn't it? Actually, the franchise kind of shows time and again that Han really sucks at that and just continually gets himself in more trouble. Luke Skywalker hardly hears Han Solo's whispered farewell. May the Force be with you. Once again, movie does it better by having him hear it and said directly to his face. Not sure why the initial idea was to have it whispered anyway. Luke expresses his disappointment about Han leaving to Leia, and once again a platonic peck on the cheek becomes full-on make-out in this comic. No wonder they needed to do another version of this for the special edition. At this rate, the comic's gonna end with the two of them in bed together. Biggs is here too! Luke, I don't believe it! How do you get mixed up in this? Better question is how did you get mixed up in this, Biggs? It's been like two or three days! Luke had the Death Star plans and Leia! How did you manage to join the Rebellion and their secret base that fast? They also meet a fighter group leader, Biggs vouching for Luke despite him never having flown in an X-Wing before. Outer Rim? Skywalker? 
Of course! I met your father once, when I was just a boy. Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? Anyway, R2 is loaded up into Luke's X-Wing to provide navigation and other useful features, and the fighters are launched to end issue 5. Blue boys, this is Blue Leader. I'm blue, daba dee daba die, over. The final cover is a complete lie. It shows Luke and Vader fighting each other with their lightsabers, Leia recoiling in horror nearby, a Y-Wing fighting some TIE fighters. None of this happens in the comic. Like, the closest you get is that there are Y-Wings in the Battle of Yavin in the movie, but we don't see any of them in the comic. It's just X-Wings. We see, like, a cockpit of a Y-Wing. That's it. See Luke Skywalker battle Darth Vader! Like, that doesn't even happen! Sure, Vader fires a few shots at Luke, but it's not even really a battle between them in an abstract sense. Although, come to think of it, that is kind of weird, isn't it? That Luke never fights Vader in A New Hope? Bear in mind, Lucas was not thinking sequels when he wrote this film. As far as anyone knew, Star Wars would be a done-in-one. And we've seen my coverage of the adaptation of the earlier draft where Luke is an unrelated character and Anakin's dad did not die at Vader's hands. Vader killed Luke's father and brought down the Jedi. Shouldn't he be the final villain Luke takes on in A New Hope? But no, Vader not only never fights or even meets Luke, but he's just sent off into the ether until Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, it makes sense as the first part of a trilogy, but again, this wasn't supposed to be a trilogy at first. Anyway, the attack commences, the Death Star even being upside down here. 30 minutes! That's how long the main rebel base has before the Death Star, gigantic battle station of the Galactic Empire, will be in a position to destroy it. Or their pizza's free! But the base will be gone, so they can't do delivery. Not much to cover here, honestly. This is the entire final act of the movie where we make the desperate attack and trench run. As the battle continues and the fighters are able to evade the Death Star's defense systems, Vader orders fighters launched and decides to go out there too. And of course, the true hero of Star Wars gets taken down, even called by name... Porkins! Porkins, do you read? Eject! Eject! I, I'm okay! I can hold her! Just... Those are the last words ever uttered by the man Luke Skywalker knows only as Blue Six. Where is my Disney Plus Porkins series, damn it? But Biggs has fought beside Lieutenant Tono Porkins for long weeks and months, and he knows suddenly what it means to lose a friend. So long, Piggy. You will be avenged. Damn right! I'm sure Biggs has a long future ahead of him where he gets vengeance for Porkins. Dumb question, perhaps, but why were those panels included anyway? Blue Leader makes his shot at the exhaust port, but he misses. Vader, in turn, blows him away. Ah, oh, the tragic irony that he was blown away by that pilot he met as a boy. With all the other attempts failing, Luke, Biggs, and another pilot, Wedge, need to go down and make their own attempt. Luke hears Obi-Wan speak to him briefly. It is a young old voice which sounds in his ears. The hell does young old mean? Ben. Ben Kenobi. Then... Maybe he wasn't killed by Darth Vader's lightsaber after all. Maybe he merged somehow with the Force, and he's here with me in spirit. Right now! Or, looking at my screen, it seems I am leaking oxygen right now. R2, can you fix that before I start hearing Uncle Owen's voice too? Just wow with that thought cloud. Like, no ambiguity or mysticism. Oh hey, Obi-Wan must have merged with the Force. Obvious in hindsight. Anyway, the three make their run down the trench, Vader and his fighters in hot pursuit. And unfortunately, Porkin's revenge will not be today, as Vader destroys Biggs. Now this is pod racing. Wedge's ship gets damaged and he has to pull away, leaving Luke alone with Vader about to fire, but then a shot comes from above. By the immortal gods of the Sith! Ah yes, Vader's classic catchphrase. The Millennium Falcon comes in out of nowhere. The Falcon's intervention causes Vader's wingman to veer off suddenly, striking his lord's ship as he goes. Damn it, we need to exchange insurance information. Vader goes careening off into space as Han calls out to Luke. You're all clear, kid! Now blow this thing so we can all go home! This reveal was like an hour and a half long and we need to wrap it up already! Obi-Wan does not actually tell Luke to use the Force here, just trust me. Which is not a sentiment shared by the Rebels on Yavin, who starts screaming that he's insane to turn off the targeting computer. He fires, and indeed, the torpedoes head into the exhaust port. Luke and the remaining ships hauling ass out of there. The Death Star explodes and... 
God damn, that is a friggin' beautiful explosion. Kudos, comic. Even the narration is pretty damn good. The collapsed residue of the Death Star will continue to consume itself for several days, forming, for that brief span of time, the most impressive tombstone in this corner of the cosmos. And, of course, engraved on it, this one's for Porkins. No voice of Obi-Wan saying the Force will be with him always, just our heroes returning to base and celebrating. In the final page and epilogue, our heroes march down the aisle. Luke and Han receiving medals. Dumb question, but where did they get these medals? Why do they have them? What good are they really? Why are they even still on Yavin doing this? Sure, the Death Star was destroyed, but I've got to imagine the Empire would start sending conventional weapons right at them to investigate what happened, and they should really start evacuating. And so our comic ends with the narration promising a lot for the future of these characters. Next issue, a new adventure of the Star Warriors. Wait, Star Warriors? Weren't those the guys who made Superman fight Muhammad Ali? Anyway, this comic is really not as good as the movie, obviously, but damn if it ain't a noble effort. Stuff like weird coloring is easy enough to get past. What hurts the story are those moments that have become iconic in the film. Lines and the way things were portrayed that have stuck with pop culture all this time being missed or altered. Obi-Wan joining the Force. Use the Force, Luke. The timing of certain events, etc. But none of this is bad. As an adaptation, especially one that was made before the film came out and didn't have all those elements established that made the film a hit and this universe so expansive and filled with exciting new developments and stories, it does a phenomenal job carrying over so much of the movie. It definitely has the quick pacing and action down, with the narration doing a good job of providing dramatic prose to advance and enhance the scenes. It admittedly can feel a bit bloated in the text as a result, but some of that is just the writing conventions of the time. Nothing was really left out when they probably could have made enough cuts to condense this into five issues, and hell, it doesn't even have as many pages as comic adaptations nowadays do, what with each issue only being around 17 pages, while a comic these days is around around 20 to 22 per issue. It's easy to see why this adaptation was so popular, especially as this was a cheaper way to re-experience the movie than going to the theater over and over. The home video market not really being much of a thing yet for movies. And led into the successful original Marvel Star Wars comics. The movie may be better, but this was a damn good adaptation, and it's understandable why it would get some re-releases over the years. Next time, we hopefully have a shorter video, as we get a Patreon-sponsored review of a Marvel Man comic. No sign of him, even with these electro binoculars. That's funny. Electro binoculars was also the last name of one of Luke's friends. Everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? Hello, my friends. Please be sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the bell, and share it with others. And if you get a chance, maybe check out my Patreon.